Here we are. <laughs> I'm so, Shannon Butler. I'm Sue Teresi, along with Lila, my cat, and welcome to All, All My, my favorite, favorite People Are, are dead. dead. Yay! <laughs> Pushing up daisies, dead. Yes. <laughs> Six feet under, dead. <laughs> Gone but not forgotten, dead. Not forgotten. Okay. So, um... How are you? Uh, yeah, we're well, I'm not dead. So we're not dead. We're we're alive and kicking. That's we're something. alive. Shannon and I and Lila. Lila? Now she won't do it. She won't talk. She won't now. meow now. She's, She's like, nope. meowing a storm. Now she won't meow. Nope, not gonna do it. She won't do it now. Nope. nope. <laughs> she she's all talked out now. She's like, forget it, I have nothing left to say. She was talking while I was trying to get this you thing ready to record. You won't talk? Oh, oh. Now, she'll... now she'll do what was that? Lila! Nah, we got a little. We got a little. We got a little. She's like, I'm done with She's you. Like, uh, I, I, I've given you a piece of my mind. I, I, I did all, I've said all I needed to say. Yeah, I'm done. I'm, <laughs> you don't She's, listen anyway. She's microphone shy. Yeah, there you go. My camera shy. There you go. She's, there's no box. Like She's my, kind of interested. My dog Mocha, like he will absolutely look stunning. And I'll go, wait, wait, hold that get the and try to take... No. no. No, no. They know. Yeah. They know. They know you have a camera. They yeah. know when something's up and it has to be on their, on their terms. Not like Daisy and Franklin, they'll be like, oh, we're posing? Uh. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. But... I might only do that when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> I don't know if it's the warmth of the computer or I'm yeah. not paying attention. Yeah. And and that's when, like, they're all swarming on the keyboard. They're, they're like, oh, look, look at me. Where her cat. <laughs> Oh, here we are. Here we oh, are. Here we are. Look at us. <laughs> not at her. And then everything has to stop. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, look at the kitty. And then no work gets done. Because right. everybody's That's looking at the kitty. I mean, I feel like the past couple of years of the, the whole pandemic, like, not a lot of work has gotten done, really. Like, no, I do too much work on Zoom. <laughs> I went to Zoom Academy. Do you know that? Zoom I spent, Academy. I swear to you, we, we switched to the Zoom platform. My school went right away, like, that was that March or April, mm -hmm. and they sent me two or three days to Zoom Academy, okay. and I had to learn how to share screen, and the whiteboard, and all these, because, you know, when you work with kids, and yeah. all of that, and it became very intense. Yeah. So, true. yeah, I was like, I was like, wow, 30 years of teaching, and all of a sudden, I say something like, unmute yourself. Yeah. Put the fork down. <laughs> Don't make me text mom to come in there. Uh. I mean, things you never... <laughs> Thought you would say as an educator. Yeah. I'm like, really? Wow, this is, yeah. Try to take a pencil out of their hand. Doesn't work. No. Nope. <laughs> and then I had a kid. I finally saw the kid after a year and a half on Zoom live, right? Mm -hmm. Kid comes up to me and goes, Boy, Miss Teresa, you're a lot bigger on Zoom than you are in person. Oh, I'm like, no. yeah, oh, I guess in that little box, that Short little brain. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. He didn't realize that I'm I'm a petite person. And he's like, Well, you look so much bigger on the box. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really big on Zoom and really tiny up close. Oh, so okay. it's it's funny, their perception yeah. of you. It's yeah, it's yeah. very funny. It's very funny. Well, I'm sure it, I being an educator such as you are all this time has has been really challenging, I have no doubt. Um it was kind of weird, like, on my end of things for, you know, doing the local history stuff as a historian. I still write, I still research, which is fine. Right. But then, like, during programming, yeah, I had to switch to Zoom, too, a bunch of times. And it's very different. Yeah. And now you've got a lot of people who still would rather do Zoom than come in. <laughs> I'd rather do Zoom than meetings, especially yeah. meetings that should have been an email. Yeah. I'm like, this should have been an email. But, right. yeah, I'm like, why do I have to go out now and put on my boots and warm up my car to go to a yeah. meeting? When I could just put on my computer or do it, you know, on my phone in my car while I'm driving. Right. Yeah, okay, I get the idea. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever go back with certain things. I'm like, yeah. it's it's okay. Yeah. It, it serves a purpose somewhere. I, I don't. I think maybe now we'll do away with snow days too. Right. Yeah. Because there's no reason to have snow days. You got Zoom. I, you got a computer. Okay. You got internet. Man, I'm so glad that I was a kid when I was a kid. Because <laughs> so snow days were the best. We barely had any. I was the kid that walked eight miles in the snow to get to school. Both ways. Both hell. ways with no boots, <laughs> you know, with my, my books in a, in a 
strap, a belt, you know, over my shoulder with a bandana. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, no, oh, like a hobo kid. Pretty, yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> uh, well, like a, a hood kid, but yeah, no, we didn't get snow days. No. I think like twice my whole childhood. That school was open and you were going. All right. Yeah, I, uh, my, it was a bit of a haul to get to my school, so the buses would be like, nope, we can't do it. All right. Yeah, we walked. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Uh, this week, it's all, it's you, really. It's all you, me. You've done a ton it's, of research. I've done, and I, I, because I could have gone on with this person and on and on. Okay, so you ready? All right, so who are we talking about? Well, who doesn't know Mickey Mouse? <gasps> oh, that guy, the rodent. The rodent, yeah. the big, the big rodent. Who doesn't know M-I-C, right? Mickey yeah. Mouse. Okay, yeah. everybody knows. If, unless you've been under a rock somewhere, you know Mickey Mouse, okay? Naturally. People don't speak, everybody knows the mouse. The mouse. Okay, Doesn't home of the mouse. country you're in. The mouse, you everybody, know. you yeah. show picture of the mouse, it's like Coca-Cola. Everybody, right. it's universal, all right? International. So, Walter Elias Disney was born December 5th, 1901 in Chicago and passed away December 15th in 1966 in Burbank. But he did a lot in the middle there. Oh my gosh, for, yeah. He, 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 seriously, Walt is best known as an American animator, a pioneer of the American animation industry. He held the record for most Academy Awards, both earned the nominated, yep, having won 22 Oscars with 59 nominations, two Golden Globe Special Achievement Awards, an Emmy, just to name a few. Okay, that's a lot. He, he really did a lot with his life, really what you would call um, a man of tomorrow, a real innovator, a real future seeking guy ahead of his time he really was okay believe it or not he was shy and private but he adopted a warm and outgoing public persona he had a sister but was the fourth son of elias and dora of flora rather disney and they were english and german all right so he started taking art classes as a kid by 18 he's a commercial illustrator he's not wasting time he knew what he wanted to do Okay. Okay. He developed his ability. He's working with watercolors. He's working with crayons. Had a passion for trains of all things, but really developed his artistic talent. This is who he was at an early age. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he goes and tries to join the army, but he's too young. So he forges the date on his birth certificate to join the Red Cross in 1918 as an ambulance driver. Okay. Shipped off to France, drawing cartoons on the side of his ambulance. <laughs> No matter what, there's going to be some animation. Okay. This is like the man was breathing, had ink in his veins, right? <laughs> uh, by 1920, he was into cutout animation techniques. He buys a camera. He experiments at home. But then he comes to the conclusion that there's this thing called cell animation, and that's much more promising than cutout. So he opens a business with a co-worker, and they produce short cartoons. By 1921, the success led, led to the establishment of Lefagram Studios. Lefagram, okay, yes. Yep. The cartoons didn't provide enough money, so they produced a production of Alice in Wonderland that combined live action and animation. Not the one we know. This is a pre-pre-Alice. Yeah. It was a 12 and a half minute, one real film, and the studio went bankrupt in 1923, so not e. much going on there. E. Okay. But wait, there's more. So Walt moves to Hollywood, 21 years old. He and his brother Roy form the Disney Brothers Studios, which later becomes the Walt Disney Company. He gets married in 25. Everything is going along, right? Mm -hmm. In 1928, Walt develops Mortimer Mass. You know Mortimer? No, you don't. Mortimer? No, I'm no, not familiar with No, because his wife Lillian says that's a little pompous. Let's go with Mickey. Mickey. I like it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mickey was, was created, and uh, he provided uh, uh, Mickey's voice until 48. So Mickey Mouse first appeared in 1928 as a screen test for a short. Uh, on the third short, that was the infamous Steamboat Willie. You ever see Steamboat Willie? I have. Yeah, yes, that's the that was the there. third, the, the, the one that really gets to everybody. Um, so Disney is now using synchronized sound to create the first produced sound cartoon. Cinephone, yes, Cinephone, became the new distributor of Disney's early sound cartoons and became very popular. So now he's working on all these techniques, improving the quality of the music, providing stories through the use of music, and hired several local artists. Everything is going great. Pluto is introduced in 1930. Pluto. Goofy. <laughs> Mickey. <laughs> he was in 1932, Mickey. <laughs> and finally, Donald Duck in 1934. Oh, Donald. Gang's all here. All right. So, 34 now becomes the golden age of animation from 34 to 41. That's like the big animation um, time. 
Walt is getting tired of little cartoon shorts by 34. He thinks he could do a feature full length cartoon. And people were like, uh, no. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Because you got to remember, 34, right? Mm -hmm. It's before Wizard of Oz. It's before, uh, you know, Gone with the Wind. Right. And he's talking about cartoons. Yeah. Nobody wants to sit and see a cartoon. Oh, yeah? The studio began a production right back to, you guessed it, Snow White. And um, Snow White with the Seven Dwarfs, it is the first animated, full color, full sound feature, costing at that time $1.5 million to produce three times over budget at that, that time. Right. Full cartoon, full everything. That's okay. It, it, sure. <laughs> He sent, but what, what do you get for $1.5 million? Well, I'm glad you asked. He sent his animators to classes. He brought animals into the studio to, to study realistic movements. He developed multi-plane cameras, which allowed drawings on glass to be set at a ver various distances. He created the illusion of depth. I mean, the works. Mm -hmm. He's really, you know, they're watching real animals, and, and you know, he's bringing stuff in. This. He's really, again, ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, he's driving his bankers nuts. You know, well, temporarily, because Snow White premiered in December of 37, became the most successful picture of 38. By May of 39, it made a gross of 6.5 million. Not too shabby. So I would say he got a return on the buck. You pay a lot, but you made a ton. He did a good job. Then, you know, seeing that full end cartoons with sound and music and the whole bit, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for several years, Walt's like, hmm, you know what? I think I'm going to buy a theme park. I want to make a theme park. I want to I wanna do more than movies at this point. Um, Disneyland in California opens in July of 1955. The opening ceremony is watched by 70 million viewers, broadcast from ABC on live television. Okay? So he did other things. They had the world of Disney. They had TV shows. He had the movies. But he wanted something more. He wanted a real, a real theme park, mm -hmm. which was a, you know, still a novelty. Um, so 3.6 million guests the first year, right? Over, did I say that? 20,000 20, visitors daily. Okay. By 1964, they had the World's Fair. Disney's providing exhibits for, for uh, the New York World Fair. It included, oh, a little small boat ride I'm sure you've heard of, you know, with a song that gets stuck in your head. <laughs> the Carousel of Progress and an animatronic version of President Lincoln. So he comes up with these things at the World's Fair and they get incorporated later into the theme parks. All right. Okay. Unfortunately, like our last friend Rod Serling, Rod was a very uh, Walt was a very heavy smoker. Yes, he was. Yeah. All of them were at that time diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, died December fifteenth, nineteen sixty six, at only sixty five years of age. So in October of seventy one, Disney World opens in Orlando. Okay, never lived to see it. Roy saw it through. Um, Epcot, and you know Epcot. You know what Epcot yes. stands for, right? For those of you who don't know. Epcot actually stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Yes. He wanted a whole community there. Right now, Epcot is just one of the parks in Florida. He wanted like this whole experimental commune type of living, but that wasn't going to fly. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, I, I wonder, like if you've been to, to Florida, it's like all swamp It's like a little country. Mm -hmm. It's its own little world. It's, a, it's got its own fire thing and a police thing and its own everything. And, you know, there's, other than that, there's like what I saw driving around is just swamp and gators. You know, I'm like, <laughs> what would have been down here had he not bought this and made a little metropolis? Yeah. You know, he put Florida on the map. I mean, truthfully, the only reason I go is to go to, go to Disney. I don't know. Who yeah. needs Florida? I, I mean, I'm sure it's nice, but, you know, I'm not, it never occurred to me to go there. You know, just for something that's not Disney, other than NASA. I mean, I, I don't know. I, what would have happened to Florida without Disney? Yeah. I asked myself that. Yeah, it's, it's true. So, uh, Walt and his wife, Lillian, they had two daughters, Diane and Sharon, who was adopted. Um, many of Disney's films, right? You ever watch the films, Mom is Dead, The, the Kid is Orphaned? There's, yeah. You ever ask yourself... What's up with that? I, I think I saw Bambi as a kid, and all of a sudden it's mom, mom, bang, thump, mom's gone. Saddest scene. Traumatic. Ever. Yeah. Scar, right? Scar, when Scar kills uh, Mufasa, and then the little lies like, Daddy, get up. Daddy's not getting up. You know, yeah. these things are traumatic. What, I always said, what is, what is the idea here behind him orphaning the, the, the main character? Why right. is the kid, especially with mom? 
why is mom, you know, uh, hunchback mom, mom dies on the steps of the church, you know, Tarzan, the parents get killed immediately, even, even now with Elsa, right? Elsa right. and Anna, yeah. well, apparently they're going down in that boat, you know? What is the story? Now, there's two schools of, of thought here. One is that the central character has to basically lose a parent in order to mature. That's like a passing of a torch. Apparently, the only way you grow up is if your mother or your parents die. Well, that explains why I've never grown up, because my parents are still There you go. Kicking, well, there you go. So, you know, right. <laughs> no, I, I think I'm fairly mature. I don't know. No, you, I, don't, I don't subscribe to that, that thought. I don't think your parents have to die in order for you to mature. I don't think it comes down to that. Okay. All right. So okay. that school of thought is a no. I, I, you know, I've seen it. I don't subscribe to that. Some people do. Okay. To me, the, the second uh, and much more darker side is that once Walt and, and his brother Roy began making buku bucks, they um, do what a lot of people do. They bought their parents a house. Oh, right. Which is lovely. So they yes. buy mom and dad a house. Unfortunately, I don't know how past inspection because it was his major gas leak. Yeah. And the father survived, but mom didn't make mom it. Mom died, yeah. So, you know, you, you say to yourself... At the, well, how, how did that happen? I mean, it couldn't happen now, I guess, you know, with the gas leak. She, Actually, you know, and I, I, I remember reading about this, yeah. about this happening. Um, Weird Al Yankovic, who I'm a, I'm a big fan of Weird Al Yankovic, his parents both died. Like Same way? Yeah, just recently, like a few years ago. He bought them a house? Uh, well, or it was just I a gas know, leak? Was a house that he, they died from a gas they leak? They died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Th- I think it was actually a fireplace issue. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, these things happen. I, I know, you know, I, I have, uh, uh, my house had to be brought up to code. You have to have a smoke detector outside every bedroom yeah. on every level and plus a carbon monoxide tester on right. every, I mean, I have them throughout the house. Okay. I can understand these things happen. You have a, a radon leak, a gas leak, you know, the canary dies. Okay. I understand that mm-hmm. to buy your parents a house as a gift and then find out the house is almost like what killed her. I think haunted him for the rest of his life. Yeah. This sense of responsibility for killing his mother, yeah. and that even I don't know if there's something written in it, into it that most of these, the, a lot of these films deal with the with the kid becoming an orphan or the mother dying. That's I think that plays into it much more than you know the first school of thought. I mean that that's that's what I think. Okay. I don't know. It's it's a, right. tragic though for him to have to live yeah. with that. You no. buy parents a house for the house to kill her. You know, and it's just, it's just she didn't make it. it was, it's very tragic. So Walt Disney remains the central figure in the history of animation. You cannot think of animation w- without, without him. Um, through technical innovations and alliances with corporations, he has transformed the marginal form of communication, like cartoons, into a multinational leisurely industry giant. International. Giant corporations. For someone like me, I have been to... Yeah, I'm not, I should, probably shouldn't break. Three times this year. <laughs> I don't know why. It just happened that way. <laughs> we went for the holidays last year. It was the 50th anniversary. Mm-hmm. We just went for Halloween. Still celebrating the 50th anniversary, but I had to trick-or-treat around the Magic Kingdom like a five-year-old in a costume because that was always a bucket list thing. Wait, what were you dressed up as? Pirate. I was, right. I was a, we, we, yes, we stayed in the pirate room and I had to dress up as a pirate. And then we go to we go to Paris over the summer, and I'm like, oh, Paris Disney, and they're celebrating their thirtieth. Okay. So that's three times I went this year alone. You are a fan. Uh yeah. You get like, I mean, where else can you see like grown ass men, like big football playing grown ass men, heavily heavily tattooed, walking around with mouse ears <laughs> and a shirt that says Papa Bear. And a little princess doll, you know, when you see them walking around with their kids and, you know, families that are all walking around in the matching gear. And, but there is something, all right, nerdy, yeah, but charming about it. Uh-huh. It's a, I see grandparents with their kids and their grandkids and they go back and it's a whole, and everybody's laughing except for the kids that are, you know, pitching a bitch fit and having tantrums, well, you know. Wasn't this his whole idea was to create this idyllic... Happy universe. place. Yeah, like it was It was based on a, a town that he had spent some time in as a kid, uh, Marceline. Yes, yeah. And it was very Rockwellian yeah. and very, you know, Main Street USA yeah. and very picturesque. And, and it, it is. I mean, I have a smile on my face when I walk around until I get the bill, you know, because it's um, <laughs> oh, bibbity bobbity broke. <laughs> you know, that's sometimes how it works, but joke's on me. Yeah. How do you not walk around there with the with the princesses and the castles, just everything that he's done and the innovation and the land of tomorrow? And uh, 
I don't know. I, I'm a big kid at heart, and it is the m- most magical place on earth. I could not picture cartoons or or any of, of the things that, especially I grew up with, without without Walt Disney, a visionary. I'm a, a big fan, and he's he's one of my favorite people who are dead. So then, what's your favorite Disney movie? Is that that's a that's a lot to ask, probably. I don't know if I actually have. A, I think one of my favorites I would say is Mulan. Mulan, okay. Because, you know, I like the evolution of the Disney heroine. I taught a class on that last year oh, to the high schoolers. Yeah. That sounds like fun. It, it really was. It, um, you know, you think of, of the 30s, Snow White sitting around waiting for her prince to come, right? Mm-hmm. And then you think of, you know, Sleeping Beauty and all of that. And the evolution, Mulan, wait for, Mulan saves the emperor. Mulan is kicking ass. She's going <laughs> after the Huns. She's doing, she don't need a man. She saves him. <laughs> that whole evolution... And it's almost like, um, I don't know if you know Isaac Bachevitz singer did Yentl. No, it's, it's a Jew thing. Okay, so Barbara Streisand. <laughs> okay, Barbara oh, Streisand. My you, Jewish you, knowledge. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Barbara Streisand, in the movie version, um, she wants to study, and at that time women weren't allowed to study. Mm-hmm. So she disguises herself as a boy. And she goes to Yeshiva and she studies. And it always, there were some scenes that I compare that always remind me of Mulan, you know, where she's cutting her hair and she's disguising herself in a very male dominated society. They have to do what they have to do right. for themselves, even if it means dressing up as a guy and, mm. you know, saving the emperor. Yeah, watch, watch Yentl if you, if you can. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. Barbara Streisand's coming out in a new movie. Did I tell you that? It's no. all about soup. They're calling it lentil. <laughs> oh good she left I'm sure no, but everybody's groaning everybody's groaning that's another Jewish joke I like oh I get it you get it? Like it okay no it is a fabulous yeah. movie in the yeah. book it, it was written as a short story but things I so so I think in a way that that that's like the quintessential you know I'm not waiting for my prince to come like I got this I'll do it myself I'll kick ass myself I don't need a man hmm. type of thing with the evolution um yeah, and then they did a live version of Mulan. I mean, I like the cartoon better, mm-hmm. Eddie Murphy, you know. But um, yeah, so I don't know where my childhood or my kid's childhood would have been with without without Disney. Yeah, I, I remember as I was like when I was a kid, I was definitely interested in Disney films. Yeah, um, I was a big fan of Pocahontas. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's a great why. story. Um, They're great stories, and then I I really liked um, the the Beauty and the Beast, the, like the '90s cartoon version. Sure. Um, and I man, I wanted that golden gown that be- that, that, that Belle yeah. had. Like, yeah, we like, all did when I was a kid. Like, yeah. I'm, even though I was a tomboy, I'm like, I want that fucking dress. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this past Halloween when I. The kids were out doing their thing, and one girl came up with like that, just like the perfect bell gown. And I was like, I never fucking had that it's not as too a late. kid. We're gonna have a costume party. Like, what? We're gonna get it. I for want. You. I want it. We're gonna get I it for it. you. Uh- <laughs> Me, for me, Bell is locked in his house, right? Yeah. And she's got that library. Did you see that library? And she's got oh, yeah, like you know silverware library. bringing her stuff every. And I'm like, and this is a problem. Is it right? I would trade places with her if I could stay in that library and yeah. read the whole time and have you know silverware and candelabras bring me stuff okay wait. that doesn't sound like a bad deal and am i the only one who actually preferred the beast when he was the beast and no. then when he turns into a man i was like oh he's not that good looking Get no him. i back the fur <laughs> yeah he kind of looked like a big like lion like um yeah. cat, cat. I thought, I thought he like... had a cat you know kind of uh appeal yeah. to it which yeah i actually was okay with that food uh Li- books and Li- a cat. library cat big cat I mean, Big cat, and you know, and, and the cup and saucer bringing you dinner. This sounds great. I don't see how that's a this, problem. No. I I see why she's like, Dad, go home. I got this. <laughs> I could live Stockholm like that. Like it's, a, it's little like, bit, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. With the yeah, so I I could have done that easily. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I just saw the new Pinocchio. Did you see that with Tom Hanks? No, I didn't. Watch it. it. You got Plus, right? Disney Plus. Uh, I I broke down and got it just to watch Hocus Pocus too. <laughs> My friends got it to watch Dancing with the Stars. Oh, I don't yeah, know yeah, that. yeah. I know, I know people that do, which is I. I mean, we had it, so I watch all that anyway. Yeah. So the new one, he plays Geppetto, and I love Tom Hanks. He could do I love anything. Tom Hanks. Yeah, he, he can do but anything. he's Geppetto, and yeah. it's and it's sad because I think in this one, like his son is dead, and then he builds uh-huh. the the puppet to look. It's a little more tragic than the well, a lot of cartoon. Are. They're just <laughs> so. Some of them are brutal. They really can be. They really, you know, they're they're a little brutal. Once you get past that, as an adult now that I watch it, it's it's got a whole different, you know. 
when you watch it with your kids, it's got a whole different thing. I mean, honestly, anything fucking makes me cry these days. So it's no, like, I know. Well, I can't watch yeah, anything. No, I, I cry watching McDonald's commercial. <laughs> Oh, God, it's a fry! It's too much salt! <laughs> too much salt. Oh, no! Oh, oh, no, it's so sad! Somebody dropped a chicken nugget! No! no. no. Pinocchio, I actually read that book in book club. It was, it started out, the guy who wrote it was jailed. It was an Italian guy from a long, long time ago. But it was supposed to be a political statement. Oh. How it was a puppet government and with the jackets and all that. And it started out, and he got, he, he served time for that. Oh, wow. Start, yeah, it started out, nothing to do with kids. It had to, it was a political statement. Well, I guess um, uh, Disney had to take a lot of liberties. Yeah. When he was like, oh, I'm going to use Pinocchio for this movie. And then he's like, right. well, shit, we're just going to rewrite this whole thing. We're going to, yeah, it's not, not going to be that. It's yeah. going to be this. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and now they do the live action versus the cartoon. And okay. I, they, they, I get I get hooked. I'm, but I'm easily entertained. <laughs> That's okay. And, oh, shiny. Right. Well, look, Shannon, it's shiny. Shiny. Oh, boy. <laughs> But um, I don't I don't know uh, where a lot of people would would have been without the Mickey Mouse Club and you know, sure. MIC and it's so so internationally known yeah. so so cosmic a universe well, of its own. It's like when you win the Super Bowl, what do you say? I'm going to Disneyland. That's right. You know, that's like, right. Well, what are you going to do? Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. So it's it's quite the legacy. Walt is Walt. Walt now, is Walt. You know, I've I've read some some things about Walt Disney, and I've seen some documentaries, and I I, I understand that he was kind of a kind of a dark guy like he was a perfectionist yeah uh, like Hitchcock and all of them yeah. but I think any any serious artist that really holds their craft above and beyond can be a stickler I mean I looked up oh Walt was anti-semitic Walt was a communist I looked up both of those things I understand that he hated communism like he, he was blaming communism on the like right. the uh the union issues that he was having on his company. And his he was anti-communist. He made the mistake. He had some guy, and he didn't realize the guy was like an upcoming Nazi, and he had the guy in on a tour of the studio. Oh. And that took a life of his own, that he was anti-Semitic. No. He, he did work for B'nai B'rith. He had so many higher-ups in the company that were all Jews that all said he was wonderful to work for. Okay. So many of his employees. No. Oh, there she goes. Oh, there you are. Lila! And there you have it. There she is. And there you have it. Do you like Disney? She, she does. She likes the Aristocats. Uh, Everybody wants to be a cat. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's very vocal now. Okay. She's, she's going to have a whole conversation. She is. She's like, I want to give my two thoughts, two uh, cents on Disney. She's our third podcaster. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're now a trio. I mean, I, I know my dogs have been on the show before. But, there you uh, go. But she's definitely chiming in. Very vocal. Yeah. So, okay. So, I um, when you said you were doing Disney... I thought, okay, well, I've always been intrigued by the um, the lack of, of female animators, but there were female animators in yeah. the early days of, of Disney, and I thought I actually printed out this uh, this letter, and uh, which has Look which at came you. from the, yeah, it came from the Walt Disney uh, Company, and this was a standard letter that a lot of talented women got in the 1930s, 40s. And it was from the Walt Disney Productions, and this was actually for um, Mary Ford. Mary Ford was trying to sign up to be a, um, to to actually be be a part of this uh, training course that they were doing to train um, their artists at Disney. And uh, it says, women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing for cartoons for the screen, as that work is performed entirely by young men. Uh, for this reason, girls are not considered for the training school. The only work open to women consists of tracing the characters on clear celluloid sheets with Indian ink and filling in the tracings on the reverse side with uh, p uh, paint according to directions. Uh, and it goes on to say... Paint by number. You yeah, can do it. Hey, it's girls, you can do a paint by... What year was this? This is 1938. Well, it says... Uh, there you go. It goes on to say, it would not be advisable to come to Hollywood with the above specific, specifically in view, as there are really very few openings uh, in comparison with the number of girls who apply. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and it's really weird because a lot of these these very talented women were trying so, so hard yeah, to get yeah, into this line yeah. of work. And Disney was kind of like, he had his boys club. and, and But at that time, weren't they all? Uh, I pretty mean, much, yeah, Hollywood was like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but some women did manage to break through. So um, I just I just wrote a little bit about it. Uh, Walt Disney was really actually the first to 
to invite a few uh, very talented women into the workforce. Uh, and like you said, most Hollywood studios in the 1930s Mm-mm. did not. Not really. women friendly. Yeah. So, so soon women would be found in just about every department from creating the storyboards to defining the looks of some of the most beloved Disney characters. So the first woman uh, to be hired on was a, was a woman from, from um, Rome, Italy, actually. Her name was Bianca Ma- uh, Maholi. No, I'm not saying that right. Majoli, Majoli, Bianca Majoli. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was born in Rome, Italy in 1900. She had actually gone to school with Walt Disney uh, because she came over here and she landed in Chicago and she went to McKinley High School, um, the same school that Disney had gone to. And okay. she remembered him drawing in her girl grad book, her little like yearbook. He drew a drawing in there for so her. There you go. Uh, she remembered him very clearly as a kid. She had studied um, art and design in various schools, including the School of Art Institute in Chicago and the Grand Central School of Art uh, in New York. Uh, She actually submitted a letter to Disney, and they sat down, uh, the two of them, he sat down and talked to her, and he liked her work, and he liked her ideas, so he ended up hiring her in 1935. Okay, that's early. early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, She began writing in the story department, um, or she began working in the story department, uh, where she worked with, on the Silly Symphonies, mm-hmm. and later she worked on the conceptual artwork for the 1940s Fantasia. Okay. However, she did say that some of the men she worked with were cruel in yeah. their criticisms, and she remembered sometimes, quote, she said, I sat in the corner with my heart beating wildly, gasping for air, yeah. like she's trying hard not to slit some dude's throat with a fountain pen. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. shut the fuck up, you dumb man. I yeah, have an opinion yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, she was only paid $18 a week while uh-huh. these guys were making $100 a week. Yeah, well, so there, you like go. there you go. Just typical shit. Um, no shock there. <laughs> right. And then in 1940, when she returned from a little vacation, she was informed that she had been fired while she had was away. Naturally. So, yeah. So, smooth, guys. Uh, anyway, she went on to marry an artist named Carl Hirburn in 1942 and they opened a gallery together so she did okay um and she died in 1997 at the age of 96 okay. in los angeles so she okay. lived a good long life uh, our next female artist is retta scott uh, and she's the first woman to receive screen credit um as an animator for a disney film she started in 1938 in the story and once again in the story department um she was actually born, she was born in, I, I'm skipping a part, she was born in Omak, Washington, and graduated from Roosevelt High School in, in Washington, state of Washington, in 1934, and then she went on to um, train at the Chouinard Institute. The Chouinard Institute was the big institute that was really where most where of the artists Disney go? artists were trained. Okay. Yeah. It was a big, big institute. So anyway, um, she started in 1938 on the story department, um, but it was her sketches that really got Disney interested because she was doing sketches um, for Bambi in 1940. And she um, she was apparently made the first girl animator. That's what, what Disney called her. She's, he's like, oh, it looks like we got our first girl animator on our hands here. So she created the famous hunting dogs that were in the scene mm-hmm. um, in, in Bambi. Uh, she said that she wanted them to be, quote, vicious, snarling, really mean beasts. And they were because they were pretty scary looking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It worked, anyway, so that scene with the nasty dogs uh, had kids on the edge of their seats. That whole movie had me on the edge of my seat. Right, you know? The fire and the the, the hunter shooting the mom. But I I think the whole theme of Bambi is man's inhumanity against nature. Yeah, right. That That was the whole brutality of it was to call awareness to it even at that time yeah and, and, and the, the point gets across it, it really does, does. Yeah. But, but when you're a little girl and you're you know crying in the theater i yeah. think uh you're preaching to the choir <laughs> um now uh, she um she actually uh originally had no interest in applying to work for disney she like she because she thought that it was just a car- dumb cartoon shorts yeah. in the early days, yeah. and it was. And I'm sure it was. Right. Uh, until she saw Snow White. Okay. And then when she saw Snow White, a lot, well, actually a lot of these women were not interested in Disney until Snow White came out. And then they were all like, damn, this is legit. This is real. That was a big turning point yeah. in animation. Yeah. It, it tells a whole story. It's got the music. It, yeah. it, it's got the, the color. It's the got drama. a real... Right. Yeah. It's, it's not just goofy, you know, little um, things that don't mean anything. Right. It's a whole 
story. It's, it's art. a real, it's real art, real motion picture and yeah. art. Yeah, yeah, that really opened a lot of people's eyes. So that's what these a lot of these women are seeing Snow White and then going, I want to work for Disney. Yeah. So um, anyway, so she uh, Rena Scott ended up doing some work on Fantasia and Dumbo. And she actually retired in 1946. Was she old? No, she was 30 years old. But she's getting married. So back in those days. Can't work and have a career. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, so she marries. Um, and she actually did go back to work later on uh, when she took on a gig doing illustrations for the big golden books. Yeah. Uh, in the, and uh, she worked on Disney's Cinderella okay. uh, for that. Uh, she worked for other animating companies, too, during the course of her later years until she suffered a stroke in 1985 and died in 1990 at her okay. home in California. Uh, our next interesting character of uh, these illustrators is Sylvia uh, Moberly Holland, uh, who was born uh, July 20th, 1900 in England and had always been interested in art and photography as a child. Like she was always artistic growing up. Uh, as a teenager, she moved to London and studied architecture. And in 1919, she married a fellow student uh, named Frank Holland. Um, and they were both, they both became uh, uh, pretty prominent architects, actually. Uh, they then moved to British Columbia uh, in Canada. Her husband ended up getting a nasty ear infection uh, in 1928, which uh, it, it turned into um, mastoiditis. Oh. And he died from it, like... Like, Holy cow! Yeah, real quick, real sudden, like dying bam. from an ear infection. Yeah, I, which I did not know was a thing. So maybe back then. Yeah, I guess so. So yeah, so she was like suddenly a single mom. She had two kids. Holy cow! Right. Uh, meanwhile, the Great Depression is hitting. Right. So she decides to, uh, since the Great Depression is in full swing, even in Canada, you know, they're not hiring architects. So she's kind of fucked. So she's her husband's dead. She's got two kids. Can't she's get not a job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So oh, she's like, well, what geez. do I do? So she moves to this little farm. And then her son develops the same ear infection that her husband. Oh, no, had. no, no. And so she's like, well, shit. You know, so then uh, her doctor says, well, you got to get him someplace that's dry, a dry climate. So she goes to L.A. Okay. When she gets to L.A., um, sadly, the United States did not recognize her foreign architecture degree. Yeah. So she yeah. can't practice architecture anymore. Naturally. But since she's an artist, she can get work working um, as an illustrator. And she finds work as an illustrator okay. in 1937. But like so many others, uh, she saw Snow White and was like, ooh, I want to work for Disney. So um, she actually was able to get a meeting with Walt Disney. And he was so impressed with her artwork that uh, she was hired on the spot. Like, he was like, whoa, you're good. Right. So she worked uh, in the story department again with Bianca, the first lady we okay, talked about. Okay. Actually, uh, she worked on Fantasia as well as Bambi. Uh, though Disney apparently held her in high regard, she was actually laid off twice. Uh, once in 1941 and again in 1946. Um, Disney, I mean, for all of his grandeur and all, he, I mean, he's a great man, but he had this great issue with unions and employees wanting reasonable pay. And like, that was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, wow. for some reason, he, he didn't want to pay overtime. He didn't want to look out for the people who were making Surprising, his so surprising, yeah, right? Yeah, it was just absolutely like communism is it responsible for these unions popping up? It's like, no, dude, they want reasonable pay. Yeah, yeah. That's why you have yeah, unions you have to respect up. your workers. And, yeah. <laughs> so, so she was surprising. Yeah. She was part of the these the, a lot of the artists who were going on strike. So he saw that as betrayal. So he let a lot of these artists go after that. Um, so anyway, so she went my on way to, or no way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly Walt yeah, Disney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My way. Or nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she went on to have a successful career anyway. And she, get this, in later years, she went on to bred cats. Look, you got all these cats. Right? Oh, I should breed cats. Right? And she developed the new breed of Siamese cats, uh, the ba the Balinese. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's responsible for that. So, like, amazing. Yeah. Cat breeder, yeah, so, architect. So she went from drawing kitties to actually bringing Breeding them to the life. Like. Yeah, really, bring, yeah, really. <laughs> So, uh, pretty awesome, uh, all, 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 all her whole life there. She died in uh, 1974 in Tarzana, California. All right, uh, and our last and perhaps the most famous of all these uh, women um, animators is Mary Blair. Um, she's well known, not just for as an animator, but also as a very influential artist and one of the creators of Disneyland. Like, she was, like, the visual mm -hmm. aspect of that. Um, she's well known and respected in the art world for her um, uh, being a part of the modernism movement. Mm -hmm. 
and she was born Mary Brown Robinson in McAllister, Oklahoma, October 21st, 1911. Uh, she won a scholarship to study at the Chouinard uh, Art Institute in LA in 1931, so she's apparently good right from the start. She's like, wins the scholarship to go to this very prominent art uh, institution. Uh, she married fellow artist Lee Everett Blair in 1934 and quickly became well known for her designing work. Now, her brother-in-law, uh, Preston Blair, was already an animator. Oh, there you go. So they're all kind of like starting to get into this animation world together. Good. Um, she and her husband Lee ended up working for Ub I Works, um, uh, which was a, an animation studio also in, in California. Uh, but then uh, Disney was kind of like picking up all these artists out of that studio, mm -hmm. just ripping them all out of there, which included um, um, Mary and Lee. So uh, she didn't care much for the Disney world. Like she thought it was very restrictive. She thought, okay, they've got a standard that they follow. They I do. want to do something yeah. else. You know, they, they do. Um, so she was like, nah. after working on Dumbo and Lady and the Tramp, she's like, eh, I quit. So in 1941, she's out of there. But Walt Disney admired her so much for her work that he actually asked her and her husband Lee to join him in 1943 for this big good neighbor policy trip to South America. Oh, neat. So, yeah, so FDR, mm -hmm. uh, another one of my heroes, who we will be talking about at some point in the future. Um, he realizes that fascism is, is, is spreading quickly. So he's trying to find whatever ways he can of preventing it from making its way over here. I mean, it was already over here. Right. Um, you've got like the giant American Nazi celebration, and, you know, well, course, in, in Madison Square Garden. That's right. That's Christ's right. Sake. right. You know, so he's like, well, fuck, I got to stop it. So um, the, the good neighbor policy was to kind of like send folks down to South America to go, hey, let's not let's not fall into this fascism yeah. trap, you know, so. So he a he actually asks Walt Disney, he's like, can you, you're a rock and everybody loves you. Right, like, right. Everybody in the world loves you. Right. Go down there, say, hey, Knock don't, it off. don't, yeah. don't be Nazis. You know? <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so, um, Let's play nice in the sandbox. Don't do right. that. Let's all get along and be, be, be Hold friendly. Hold hands, sing kumbaya, let's all play nice. Yeah. So anyway, so um, Walt Disney asks, um, um, her to, go. her to go with yeah. her husband and they go down and she's so inspired by south american culture sure. and the bright colors and just the warm people and the warm scenery and she's just i mean it, it blows her mind so she comes back uh with walt and they start to work on new projects and she's given more freedom at this point okay in the 1940s and she works on 1944's the three caballeros which comes out of that whole yeah yeah yeah, project, yeah, yeah. You that's know, right she, all inspired by sure. that um, she became a concept artist and worked on other major films like Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. Um, she left Disney in the mid-50s and focused on illustrating books and various popular advertisements. She worked for companies like Nabisco and Maxwell House Coffee, there doing really well-known advertisements in the there 1950s. But once again, Walt was like, mm, I need you to come back because he's working on Disneyland and he wants her art and her concepts in Disneyland. So, <coughs> excuse me, she's one of the creators for It's a Small World. Mm -hmm. And she also designed a mural for the Contemporary Hotel in Disney, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Dis I'm sorry, Disney World in Florida. So mm -hmm. this is later on. So in 1971, she's working on like this 90 foot mural. mural in the Contemporary Hotel. It's still there today. Um, it's fabulous. Very bright, very, lots of color. It's supposed to be like um, uh, the, um, Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. with lots of people around it and stuff. It's very beautiful. cool. Everything is beautiful. Yeah. So she, uh, that was her last work for Disney. That was in 1971. And she died in 1978 at the age of 66 from a cerebral hemorrhage. Both she and Lee were both big drinkers. Uh, she might have been an alcoholic. Uh, they were big smokers, of course, which was pretty common at the time. And that might have, might have been part of her undoing. However, her art can still be seen today and still continues to spot, to inspire modern day Disney animators. I'm sure. So uh, that's just some of the ladies. Some of the ladies. That were yeah. involved. Well, in, in, in the, the 30s world and business. 40s, I think ladies had trouble in any field. It's true. It was a boys game. And Walt, like even Tim Burton, Tim Burton worked, uh, he was an animator for, uh, for the Disney's, Disney company. And he, he, there was so much creative pushback yeah. he's like i don't need this i'm going and you know he goes and then later on now everything is right night maybe before christmas when you go there <laughs> they're like well maybe we can use your stuff now uh, or, you know 2020 hindsight yeah yeah 
But um, yeah, well, there was a, there was a, we were in one of the one of the shops that had you know like uh, paintings and busts and all that, and there was a book about female animators that yeah. were, and I should have bought it. Now yeah. that I think about it, I I'll was, go back and order it. I forgot what I was reading. Um, Queens. Uh, oh, I forgot the title of the book. Anyway, um, there was a couple of good good books about it. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot written about these women. No, you don't. They, you, you don't, because they get overshadowed. They do, yeah. And uh, but, but yeah, they but, were responsible for some of these great the, images and great. Uh, and I think your your cat is eating a. Santa no, it's Claus. a cat toy. Yeah, he gets cat toys. Oh, okay. And they make a lot of noise. It's a Santa Claus hat, I think. It right? came. I get. I yeah. We just get these <laughs> things as gifts, and we have. All right. He's going to he's, town he's on that because it smells like catnip, I guess. Now all I can picture is like him. In Disney cartoon form. Oh, can you picture that? Right? Oh my gosh, can you right? picture him as a little, he'd be like one of the Aristocats. Yeah. So anyway, that the, was the Disney story. They're all our, our favorite uh, Disney and Disney people yes. who who are dead. There's all, I'm sure there's other favorite Disney oh, uh, yeah. relation people yeah. who are, are dead in some way, shape, or But the place. ladies and Walt are definitely worth, uh, yeah. you know, talking about. Absolutely. All right. All right, kitties. All right, well, thank you, dear listeners, for listening. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for another informative, fun, 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 cat-included episode of All All My my Favorite favorite People people Are are dead. Dead. Yay. Yeah.